What is going on guys? Today I'm going to talk about Postgres system columns and I thought I'll do it in a practical way instead of just theory and we'll explain the theory as we go. How about we do that? I have two sessions here on my Raspberry Pi and I have a database, a Postgres 11, a little old but it does the job on my Pi here. What I'm going to do here, I'm logged in as a user Pi here on this session and there is another session. And the reason I'm doing this is because we're going to execute multiple transactions in each concurrently in each session and uh, this will kind of show us uh, different isolation levels and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and create a table actually. Let's go ahead and create a table test uh, ID integer. Very, very, very simple table. Right? Let's go ahead and create that and I'm going to go ahead and insert uh, one value here. Right? So if I do select star from uh, test here and I do select store from test as another transaction you can see that I can see the same row because that insert statement was a new transaction that started right and then inserted the row and then committed so this is an also a misconception I suppose you can say that uh individual statement like that don't have in transactions everything is a transaction right if you don't wrap it in a transaction postgres or any that i be for that matter will start a transaction and if auto commit is enabled it will auto commit it right what i want to do here is i want to show you the columns the system columns that you see here so yeah we have a call a user column called id which is an integer field here we have a table called test so we have a con an actual file on disk with certain amount of pages associated with it probably it's just a single page because there's one row right and when we do when we see these columns the most important one that we're going to show is ctid which stands for, uh, I don't know what the C stands for, but T is the tuple ID, right? C, the idea of C is basically showing the page as well, where the page lives, right? Which the page number, and also the, the index on that page, right? Because you see the Postgres organizes things as pages, right? and they are, they are 8K each, and each tuple represent the individual indexed. Right? So tuple number zero is the first tuple in that index. Tuple number one is the second and so on, right? And I think they start from one. I'm not sure about that. So if I do CTID from test, you can see that we get zero and one. Zero, so my understanding was correct. We start from one, the index starts from one. I'm pretty sure I remember reading the code and says the TID starts from one, tuples start from one, not zero. But the pages start from zero. So we have one page and there is one row in that page, right? And if I do the same thing right here, right? of course you can so say star and then you do CTID from test, form from test, and you can see that this the current uh, the, the CTID, so zero and one. Let's go ahead and and actually insert an and another row, right? Insert uh let's do it from this transaction, from this session. Shouldn't matter, but it would be nice to do some like let's do two, right? And if I do this now, you can see that now this is showing that's the first tuple and that's the second tuple and zero two and notice that i use the word tuple and not row there is difference between them i'm going to come to that now in this minute now you see now that we have uh let's be a little bit similar here do that right so that i have row number one identified by my user id which is one and i have row number two and this is almost kind of similar right but here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do an update test set uh id equal three sad that we don't have another column but sure where id equal two right that's what i'm gonna do 
system, I'm going to update. And here's the big difference in Postgres compared to any other databases. When we do select, you see that we actually get two rows. There is another row that is kind of missing here, but it's still hanging there, if you will. Right? If I do that now, you can see that it's it says three. So zero, two, actually there is a tuple that is there. What Postgres really did here is actually created a new tuple pointing to that row, and that row now is dead. So let's clear this out. To prove that point, we can do this query, querying the stats table, which is the old table, looking for our relation, which is table test. And you can see that we have now two live tuple and one dead tuple. So there, that tuple ID two is actually still there, but it's dead, right? And the reason it's dead is because no, we updated it and we created a new one. That's how Postgres works. Postgres never does an in-place update and always creates a new tuple. So technically speaking, one row can have many physical tuples corresponding to it. And the reason we do this is for MVCC reasons, yeah? multi-version concurrency control, older transactions such as repeatable read or read committed that are still running, can still read all rows, all tuples, if necessary. Right? All right, so now that we learned about this, what I'm going to show you next is actually the other two pieces, which is uh, xmin and xmax. xmin stands for the transaction minimum. What is the transaction that actually created that row? And X max, if necessary, what transaction is actually killed that row? Right? And if you do that, you can actually see, right? you can see now these transactions, X min, X max. Beautiful. See that it's zero, the X min. So you can see that X min is 577, then the transaction who created this row is one, uh, is 577. And the transaction that created row three is 579. Right? Now let's actually be in a transaction, a logical transaction. So I'm going to begin a transaction here. I'm going to begin another transaction here. So we have two transaction in flight. I'm going to insert a row, insert into test values or four and then insert into test values five right so this transaction inserted first this transaction inserted second right and then i'm gonna do a select here same select that we did you see that the four that we inserted in this session is visible to us and that's the acid rules right i need to see what i touched but the changes that this guy made is not visible and the reason is because default isolation level in postgres is read committed that means anything that is not committed i should not see right although if i did the same exact identical query here you see that this transaction sees row five which is what it created but it does not see row four which this guy has created and we can know that this is the transaction ID, 581. That, that means my transaction ID is 581. This transaction ID is 580, right? And now, very interestingly, we can do a commit on the second transaction. And just like that, if I do a commit, if I do a query on this guy, I still only see row 5 because that's what I created, right? And 4 technically is not committed, but let's query this time from this transaction. You see now I see four and I also receive five that is created by a transaction in the future, right? I'm in the past, 580, but I'm seeing something from the future. And the reason you're seeing something in the future is because this particular select statement 
because my isolation level is read committed, it it creates a new snapshot. The read snapshot is always at the time of the query. So what Postgres is, okay, you're executing a new query. What is the latest committed transaction? The latest committed transaction is 581. So is it, all right, you're going to see 581 and less than that. Anything below 581, you're going to see it. That's the contract for read committed, right? We're going to see later if we're going to change this to isolation level to read repeatable read, and that was going to change, right? So now I am I am seeing things that are committed by other transactions, even though they started after me. That has no implication because every time, right? And let's, let's actually compare that. I'm not going to even start the transaction this time. I'm just going to insert six, right? And we know every transaction, if it changes things, it, it gets a new X ID, transaction ID. And as a result, we should get a new transaction ID. And I am as a store running transaction, I am supposed to see that other transaction changes because my isolation level, my isolation level here is read committed. I am reading any committed value at this particular point. Right? When I start this, I always ask the question, what is the latest committed transaction? And from that, is in this case, it's 582. Read anything 582 and, and lower. If for some reason you execute this query and it takes so long, right? Like if it takes this so long to execute, let's say 10 seconds, right? The transaction read point, the snapshot will become five, 582, right? That's the latest command. But meanwhile, in the 10 second where this executes, you inserted more stuff. You will not see these changes while the query changes because your snapshot was created as 582, not 583, right? So that's uh, also another compelling point. All right, uh, if I, of course, uh, if I do here, select star, you can see that I see everything except four because four was not committed, right? But at the moment I commit this guy, right? I now see everything, right? Beautiful design. And the reason is because we look through the heap, the pages, and we see, okay, uh, 580, actually this query stumbles upon 580, but it just doesn't return it to us as users because it will look at the state of the transaction 580 and we'll say, ah, that's not really trans that's not really committed. I'm not gonna touch it. And if it's not committed, you should not read it. Right? And Postgres doesn't support read uncommitted uh, isolation level. All right, let's do some fancy stuff. Let's do some repeatable read thing here. Okay. Maybe let's truncate the table so we don't get all this truncate test. Okay. Select star from test. Okay, clean. All right, so now what we're going to do here. Uh, I'm going to begin a transaction here. I'm going to begin a transaction here. So I'm going to leave this as read committed. But this guy I'm going to make as an, a repeatable read isolation level. A little different. And the way you do it is trans, transact, transaction isolation level repeatable read, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's how you do it. There you go. Right? And then, same thing. You do select star. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and insert a row here. Let's go ahead and insert a row. Insert into test values. Uh, so insert one here. And I'm going to insert into test values two. Right? And I do select right, everything. We see the stuff I changed, and you see that we start from page zero and tuple zero. That means tuple one. It means we cleaned everything. Truncate literally just truncated that page that we had, right? And here I'm gonna just do the same thing. Select. You can see that I see my change, right? And I'm I'm the second tuple. Here I'm the first tuple, right? That means I, I read something before me, but but I wasn't supposed to read it. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually commit here. Right? But and I'm gonna go ahead and actually read. You can see that I am although this is committed, 
I'm not seeing the changes. You don't believe me? Let's insert another row. Insert into test values three. Now I am going to do another query. Nope, I'm not seeing it. Why? Because repeatable read does not start the snapshot where you read stuff it does not start with the query it starts with the begin when we begin what was the 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 committed transaction at that point it was 584 was me and as a result only something 584 and below i should see anything that is above i'm not supposed to see so if i actually query here 585 and 586 started after me right and as a transaction when i start my transaction 584 that's what i'm supposed to read i'm not supposed to read anything after that that's how repeatable read actually works right and it's very interesting when you actually think about this stuff right so even if i played with this game i deleted things like i i changed the xmax the xmax is basically if, if a row is updated, we get the transaction that actually touched that row. But that's basically it. That's a very powerful concept, isn't it, right? The, the final thing I want to do is I want to kind of exceed the, uh, the page. I want to show you how the pages are rolled up, right? And uh, it's very interesting. The CTID is actually referenced everywhere in all indexes. So... <laughs> That is why it's really critical changing that if the heap, if the tuple changed its location, changes its location in, in which page it lives, you need to update all indexes. If you insert a new tuple that belongs to the new version of the row, you need to update all the indexes because all indexes actually point to the CTID, not to the primary key like a uh, classical done by AnnoDB in MySQL, right? It's different. If I'm not mistaken, I think you can do it this way, right? Select, uh, insert into test, select from generate series, maybe? There you go. We insert a bunch of rows. Look at that. We inserted a bunch of rows and we got up until 290 rows in page zero. That is it. And you can see that all of them were creating the same transaction. Understandably so, right? And then we flipped to page one and then we started over because page one is a brand new page in the heap, right? And we started uh, from tuple one, tuple two, duh, duh, duh. is it the same concept? Let's see, 290. Was it how much? 291. The first one was 290, right? The second one, we got an extra hit because probably we get because we deleted some stuff, right? Then we got page two. two 300 per, per page is too low, right? Think about it. You get only 290 rows per 8,000 bytes. That is very low. And that's probably because of the overhead and, and the page headers and the tuple headers in Postgres because it's like really massive right these headers and and, and the overhead of the headers um, it's a lot of stuff and right? there 291 291 page all right that's it I think that's it that's the end right there you go how do you exit is that how you do it okay so we have a lot of a lot of rows it's beautiful but this guy Guess what? Because it's a repeatable read, it should not see anything in the future because it's snapshot read moment started at the beginning of the transaction, not at the time of the query, unlike read committed. All right, how about we actually try the Xmax, explain the Xmax, right? But again, um, I'm going to roll back this. I'm going to truncate test and I'm going to start fresh here now that we have the table that is clean what i'm going to do here is i'm going to insert i'm going to insert into test values one and i'm going to insert into this values two okay if i query that guy i have one and two and these are the transaction what i'm going to do here is i'm going to begin a transaction that is repeatable read and then i'm going to do the select 
I'm seeing the rows because I started my transaction after those rows were created. And of course, I should see them, right? So in another transaction, I'm going to delete one of those rows. Let's delete row two. Delete from test where ID equal to. And if I query again, of course, ID two is now gone. And the reason it's gone because technically it was not physically deleted. The X max was set for the new transaction, which is probably 596. That's the new transaction that that deleted that row, right? If I go back to this guy now and I do a query, look what happened here. Now it's a beautiful uh, forensics, if you will, that, hey, I'm old. I'm an old transaction. I started before. I read those rows. I kind of placed some sort of a special lock, not shared, not exclusive, a special kind of lock that, okay, I need to maintain the state of these rows. This row was deleted in 596. I did not exist technically in 596. I, I don't care about what happens in the future because I'm a repeatable read. So my transaction should not delete that row. I should see it. And that's why, although it is gone, right? This row is going to be kept forever as long as this transaction is running. If I never commit this, this row, right? This trans this row is not. Uh, if I never commit this transaction, this tuple is never gonna be purged from the page. It's gonna stay there forever as long as this transaction lives. Why? Because it needs it. It locks it. It 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 needs that row to exist. Yeah, I don't care that you deleted it in the future, but to me, in the past, I need to see it. And that's uh, the power of the isolation level that is repeatable read. In read committed, we don't have this. When you commit something, that's it's gone. That's it. Right? And that's the same for repeatable read uh, for the uh, for the serialize for the serializable <laughs> repeatable read identical there's tiny changes between repeatable read and serializable that we're going to talk about in another video but uh, that's basically it so x max is when which transaction actually marked that tuple as deleted so let's do another fancy thing i'm gonna update test set id equal to 999 where id equal one i'm not gonna delete it per se but i'm gonna update it right so what will happen here i updated that that id is no longer one it's now 999 now if i do the query you can see that the tuple id changed it's now zero three it's a new tuple it's not the same one why? Because Postgres, that's how they work. They insert a new tuple. They never change things in place, right? So one technically still exists, and here's the proof. It's still there, but look what happened. It, it started from 594, which I'm supposed to read, because I'm supposed to read everything before 595, right? So I see, I should read this, but yeah, someone deleted that tuple at 597, but I don't care. I need to see that tuple as it exists. I need to see the old state of the tuple. The old state of the tuple is 01, right, of the row technically, and it's ID. It's probably I should have kept the ID and added another column. That's a that's a bad design in my part, but you get the point, I think, right? So that row is now row 9999, right? But it's technically the same logical row to the user. Someone just changed it. But the old transaction still saw the old tuple. And that's powerful concept. That's MVCC in its uh, prime, as they say. If your transaction lives between 594 and 597, you should see the row. 
if your transaction is after 597, you should not see that row, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's so fascinating that these two tuples are actually dead, but we're still reading them, right? Because we need them. And uh, if you actually do a vacuum, which is the operation that cleans the tuples, right? Oh, we have a, let's roll back here and then we do a vacuum, verbose test. There you go, look at this. So that's how you do it, vacuum for post test. Vacuum is the process that cleans up these old tuples, right, that are no longer. But look at this, it says, I found two dead row versions that cannot be removed yet. The oldest X men is 596, which is probably me. That is because we cannot really remove it because someone is actually, there is a transaction that is actually using it, right? That's probably why we don't need it, right? That, that's why we cannot clean it. So go ahead and let's do a commit. Although we didn't really change anything, but so go ahead and commit. Now, if I do a vacuum, you can see that found two removable rows, one non-removable row version in one out of one pages, zero did rows version cannot be removed. So they actually clean. Now they are cleaned. Those two rows has been removed. We removed two versions, right? And that's the power of Postgres. Understanding these system level uh, columns are actually critical to understanding Postgres, I think. There's so much to this. I'm still scratching the surface when it comes to Postgres. All right, guys, uh, that's it for me today. Sorry for the long video. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.